Hey, this is Jeremy, and today we're going to be talking about shock. Uh, now, shock is one of those things that it can be a difficult concept if you try to look at it as a whole. But if you try to break it down to its each individual pieces, it's going to become that much easier to understand. And that's going to be the purpose of this video. Uh, now, shock is also going to be known as a hype O perfusion. So perfusion is going to be defined as the delivery of oxygen and nutrients and the removal of waste products from the cells and tissues. So what this means is we need to make sure that um, we have our cells and our tissues that are actually getting adequate amounts of oxygen and nutrients and we're removing the waste products that are produced from that. Okay, so the two big, uh, the two big ones that we need to worry about two big nutrients is going to be oxygen and glucose. Now we're going to leave those over there to the right, but understand that perfusion is going to deal directly with oxygen and glucose. So uh, to start off with, you have the perfusion triangle, which is where this triangle is coming in at. Uh, part of the perfusion triangle is you have to have three things. Okay, so you have to have a pump, you have to have a fluid to go into that pump, and you also have to have a container. Now, this is true with plumbing or any other type of body where you're trying to move a substance. All right, so the way that the pump correlates to uh, to the body is going to be we have our heart. Our fluid is going to be dealing with our blood. And our container, that is going to be referring to our vessels. Now this is going to mean our, um, our arteries, our veins, our capillaries. This is going to include everything that is vascular related. And so together, the heart, the blood, and the vessels, they make the cardiovascular system. Now the big part uh, about what we have is uh, understanding that if there is something going wrong with these, okay, that is going to be known as shock. Okay, if I have uh, something wrong with my heart, I can be going into shock if I do not have adequate amounts of perfusion. If I have something wrong with my blood, uh, let's say I have too too little blood, then I can be in a state of hype O perfusion. Uh, which is going to be known as shock. So again, shock equals hypo perfusion. And hypo is a root word that's going to mean low in this circumstance. All right. So what we have is uh, where we have our heart, our blood, and our vessels. So to start off with, we have uh, our heart. If we have, we have two big types of shock that are going to affect the heart or two big things that are going to affect the heart that are going to result in hypoperfusion. So the first one is going to be a uh, is going to be cardiogenic shock. Now cardiogenic shock is an internal function. So what I mean by that is there is something physically wrong with the heart itself. Now something is physically going to go wrong with the heart itself in two big circumstances. Okay, if you have somebody who has a, a myocardial infarction, okay, and that's going to be a heart attack, or if I have somebody who is in an episode of congestive heart failure. So if I have somebody in a myocardial infarction what can happen is there is something physically wrong with the heart. I have the heart, uh, the heart muscle itself is starting to die. Now if I have somebody who's in an episode of car, uh, congestive heart failure that is resulting in inadequate amounts of oxygen and nutrients to be delivered, uh, that is likely going to be due to left-sided heart failure. And so what's going to happen is if I have left-sided heart failure, then I have fluid backing up into my lungs, which is going to uh, to hinder my ability to get oxygen onto my body or onto my cells. So the next part about um, about the heart, uh, the types of shock that are going to affect the heart, is you have this other one is called obstructive shock. 
Now we have two types of shock or two uh, two big causes that are going to lead to obstructive shock. Now obstructive shock is going to be an external function or an external issue. And what this means is there is the heart is functioning perfectly fine. There is nothing wrong with the heart. You have something outside of the heart that is impeding the function of the heart. Now the two big circumstances with this is going to be with a tension pneumo or you can also have a cardiac tamponade. Now, so what happens with a uh, with a tension pneumo is you have air building up inside of your thoracic cavity, and it is physically going to push uh, push blood or push the the anatomy of your heart away. So what you have is you have your heart right here, and so we have our our vena cava specifically. Okay, and so we have our lungs that are on each side. So I have my right lung and then I also have my left lung. So if I were to happen to have uh, an MI over here, or not an MI, but a, a tension pneumo thorax over here, what would happen was everything would be shifted in that direction. I would have air building up over here. So this is going to push this heart, or this section of my lung over here closer to my heart. And what this is going to do is this is going to physically move my heart over here in this direction. This is going to put pressure on my vena cava which is actually going to um, result in diminished cardiac output. My heart is being squeezed and my blood vessels are being squeezed right here. And so this is going to uh, cause a decrease in preload which we'll talk about in a different video. Now, uh, that is the big thing about the, the tension, the tension pneumo. So what happens uh, whenever you have a cardiac tamponade, you actually have a, um, it, it results in something called Beck's triad. Now Beck's triad is composed of three different things. Okay, so Beck's triad is going to be composed of, uh, first and foremost, you're going to look at your patient and you're going to see JVD, okay, which stands for jugular vein distension. Now, you're going to look at your patient and you are going to, hopefully, if you listen to lung sounds, you listen to heart tones, you're going to hear muffled heart tones. So you have a muffled heart. The reason for that is because what you have is if I have my heart right here. I have a sac that surrounds my heart. And so what can happen is if that sac starts to get filled with blood, starts to get filled with fluids, what happens is my heart is, uh, is getting surrounded with fluid. And if that's the case, my heart can get behind that fluid and it's going to sound very distant. Okay. And now the other part to uh, the other part to the third part to Bextriad is going to be a narrow pulse pressure. So pulse pressure is going to refer to your the difference between your systolic and your diastolic. So if I have somebody who has a their very first blood pressure is 120 over 80. Okay, this is my first blood pressure. Now my next blood pressure that I get, let's say it is uh, 90 over 60. Okay, So if you have 120 over 80, the way that I calculate my pulse pressure is going to be 120 minus 80. And that number right there is going to be 40. Now if I have somebody with a blood pressure of 90 over 60, then this is going to mean that their pulse pressure is going to be 30. Now let's say that for my third blood pressure that I get, it's going to be 80 over 70. Now I know that my very first pulse pressure was 40. It then went to 30. And now it went to 10. And that is my pulse pressure. And so that is what I mean by narrowing of a pulse pressure. Now to calculate, or to 
actually identify if somebody has a narrow pulse pressure, you are going to have to establish a trend of vital signs. Okay. Now a trend is going to be whenever you take three or more. So you have a minimum of three sets of vitals. So that is important. To establish a trend, you must have a minimum of three sets of vitals. Now, uh, in the case of um, a cardiac tamponade, what happens is they actually have to take a needle and insert it into the pericardial sac which surrounds the heart and they will draw that fluid out. In the case of a tension pneumothorax, they will take a needle or potentially a chest tube, insert it into the thoracic cavity and draw that air out of that. So both of those things are correctable causes and those are going to be obstructive causes of shock. They are external in nature. There is nothing physically wrong with the heart itself. Now, uh, the type of shock that we see whenever that, that is going to affect the blood, uh, that is going to be hypovolemia. So with hypo with hypovolemia, what you have is you have a low volume because you have hypo meaning low bulimia is going to be referring to volume so you have two big causes for this you have you can have medical causes such as nausea vomiting and diarrhea if you have somebody who's who's vomiting they're losing fluids there if you have somebody who's has diarrhea their body is not retaining any of that um, any of that fluid that they're supposed to be retaining from their large intestine. It's just all going straight through. And if you have somebody who's not intaking any water, so they're going to be clinically dehydrated um, in this circumstance, and that is going to lead to a low uh, volume of fluids circulating in their blood because their blood is going to uh, they are going to get sick. Now you also have another cause and that's going to be uh, due to hemorrhage. Now hemorrhage is going to mean blood and so you can have, uh, this can be from anything. If you have somebody that has an aortic aneurysm that ruptures, okay, that is going to be an internal cause of hemorrhage that is going to, um, that is going to lead to hypovolemia. They're going to be losing blood volume inside of their abdomen or inside of their chest cavity. And then you also have somebody who, if they get shot or stabbed, um, and they wind up with a arterial bleed on the outside, or they just wind up with a bleed that you cannot control, then in that case, that is going to be due to an external issue. And you'll also see uh, internal or a hemorrhage from somebody who has a dialysis uh, shunt that can actually rupture. And um, and that is going to lead to uh, to a form of hemorrhage as well. So uh, anything that is going to cause a decrease in your blood volume is going to lead to hypovolemia. Your your blood volume is low, so you're going to have hard a hard time sending this oxygen and the glucose out to the body to make sure that your body is getting its adequate nutrients and exchange of the waste products or removal of those waste products. Now when it comes to your blood vessels you have one main type of, um, of shock and that is going to be known as a distributive shock. So in distributive shock they all have the same problem. Okay, with distributive shock, it all is going to result in vasodilation. And so what that means is that their blood vessels are actually going to get larger. And as they get larger, uh, their, their, uh, their heart, their pump, is going to have a harder time sending blood, the fluid, through a smaller container or through a larger container. So due to the, the enlarged contents or the enlarged container. So what's going to happen is uh, this patient, their, their heart is going to be working extra hard. So you're likely going to see tachycardia in a lot of these except for in one circumstance as we are going to talk about. But regardless of whatever form of distributive shock we are going to be talking about, it is all going to result in vasodilation. Now we have um, four 
main forms of distributed shock that we're going to talk about. The very first one is going to be anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is an exaggerated allergic reaction and what happens is it actually causes widespread vasodilation as your body is trying to fight that infection. And that is going to be due to the macrophages and you have the histamine release that's going to be associated with it and there's a lot of other issues. But the big thing that we can do here to, uh, to help treat our patient is going to be actually giving them, um, giving them a drug and that is going to be epi. So if I give them epi or epinephrine, that is going to cause vasoconstriction due to its alpha-1 effects. Okay, now the next form of distributive shock, which is going to cause vasodilation, is going to be septic shock. Now in septic shock, you have somebody who has been so sick for so long that their body is just retaining all these extra chemicals, all this carbon dioxide, and they're going to be extremely acidic. And um, what can happen with these septic patients is um, you can have something called capillary washout. And what that means is whenever your body, your capillaries have so much carbon dioxide in them that they can no longer shunt, they can no longer constrict blood flow, everything is just going to open up. And this can be due to um, this can be due to that capillary washout from the carbon dioxide buildup, or it can be from um, from other issues, just such as the infection spreading into their blood vessels, and their their blood vessels aren't able to compensate as well. And uh, something that you will need for these patients is you're definitely going to need fluid replacement in across all distributive shocks. So anytime you have somebody in distributive shock, you need fluid replacement. Okay. Now, the next form of uh, distributive shock, that is going to be known as uh, psychogenic. So in psychogenic shock, uh, what happens is your body has widespread vasodilation and it's essentially a failed fight or flight type sequence. So typically uh, you can see this whenever somebody sees blood or somebody sees spiders or somebody sees something that makes them, uh, makes them queasy. What can happen is uh, they can actually pass out. So, and this is a common cause of syncope. So you're going to see this in um, very emotional situations where somebody may have lost their loved one as, as they're getting the bad news or as they see the good news of you know uh, somebody getting proposed to. Um, that can cause a physiologic reaction that does cause widespread vasodilation which results in them falling to the ground due to their brain not having any uh, blood flow through it. As soon as they hit the ground, their body becomes level. Their brain starts getting perfused again due to um, due to gravity. Uh, they're not having to fight it, and that's going to uh, cause them to wake up. And they're typically again, they're what happened was they had temporary widespread vasodilation. So psychogenic is a, a temporary issue. Now uh, the the fourth type of uh, distributive shock that we're going to be talking about. Uh, this one is a little bit different from the others in an aspect that uh, it is it is going to it's not going to be able to compensate the exact same way and this is known as neurogenic shock N -E -U -R -O. neurogenic shock is essentially whenever you have a spinal injury and what happens is everything below the level of that injury so if this is my person and I have my stick person here. If I have somebody that winds up getting damaged right here in their thoracic area, what can happen is everything below the level of that injury is going to attempt, uh, is, is not going to be getting any stimulus. So in this neurogenic shock, everything below the injury is going to cause, is going to vasodilate. Everything above the injury is going to vasoconstrict. So they vasoconstrict above the level of the injury and they're going to dilate below the level of the injury. 
And so this is going to cause them to be cool, pale, and clammy in the upper part of their body. And this is going to cause them to be hot and flushed and probably dry in their lower extremities. You're going to see this especially in your, your trauma patients um, who do have spinal cord involvement. And you may also wind up with a priamprism. Okay, and which is that erection in men. It's that final erection that they're going to have, and it's going to be. It can be very painful, but if you, if they've lost their neurological function, they're likely not going to feel it. And with this case, uh, they're actually going to be bradycardic as well because their body is not going to be sensing anything and so their body's not going to be able to sense that it needs to be able to send out those compensatory um, uh, catecholamines such as releasing the epinephrine initiating that sympathetic uh, uh, fight or flight response to help stimulate that, that tachycardia that's going to help compensate for your blood vessels dilating so the big thing with any of these three issues is there's not going to be very many circumstances where you have somebody who is has has bled out who's also in the process of having a, a um, myocardial infarction who's also a septic or an, an anaphylactic episode that's not necessarily going to be common so what happens is uh, in these patients our blood vessels if our blood vessels are vasodilating, my heart rate is typically going to go up, and that is to compensate. My blood or my blood volume is going to try to increase or try to maintain, and it's going to do that by reducing my renal function, which means my which is my kidneys. So it's not going to be pulling as much blood away from my kidneys. And if I have uh, blood issues where I've lost, um, so I've lost blood somehow or I've lost fluid somehow, you're going to be cool, pale, and clammy due to that vasodilate or that vasoconstriction, okay? Like what's right here, and that vasoconstriction causes you to be cool, pale, and clammy because your blood vessels have constricted to shunt all the blood flow to the vital organs, and your heart rate is going to increase in your hypovolemic patient. If I have somebody who is having in a form of cardiogenic shock, they're in a myocardial infarction, they're in congestive heart failure, their blood vessels are likely going to constrict, and that can actually make the issue worse. Their kidney function, again, is going to go down because they're going to try to maintain as much blood flow as possible. And they're going to be cool, pale, and clammy. And the same thing is going to be true for those obstructive shock patients who have a tension pneumo or a cardiac tamponade. And uh, in these patients, vital signs are going to be immensely, immensely important. And so the, the, there's three big types of shock that we're going to see, uh, or uh, phases of shock, so should, should I say. So we have compensated. In a compensated shock, it is doing exactly what it's saying. It is uh, compensating for an issue that exists. Uh, now the next form of shock is going to be, or um, the next uh, level of shock is going to be decompensated. So it's been trying and it cannot function anymore. Now this next one, this next form of shock is uh, going to be known as irreversible shock and this is the this is the patient that they are very very far gone they are very very sick and uh, it's going to take take a lot to be able to get these patients back now in these patients you have three or you have two big things that you want to look at okay and the very first thing is going to be their uh, their heart rate so what happens is in these patients you have their heart rate and then you have their blood pressure. So their blood pressure is going to be, uh, this is going to refer to 90. A 90 systolic is what we want and a heart rate is going to, we're going to be referring to 100. So in these patients, if I have somebody who is in compensated shock, their heart is attempting to compensate. So their heart rate is going to be elevated their blood pressure is going to be able to compensate and that is going to be up above 90. Now if I wind up in a situation 
or I have somebody who is in decompensated shock, it's a little bit different. Um, if I have somebody who's in decompensated shock, their blood pressure is going to be low because their heart is no longer able to compensate for whatever issue it is that they're having. But their heart rate is still going to be elevated, it's still going to be above 100, and they're going to be tachycardic with, uh, with hypo tension. Now, in irreversible shock, uh, again, this is going to be that very, very sick patient. Not only are they going to be hypotensive, meaning their blood pressure is low, their their heart rate is going to be below 100 as well. Their heart is going to be on that downhill slope, um, and they're they're not able to continue working anymore because of the hypoperfusion has gotten so bad that the gas exchange and is, is not happening effectively the nutrients are not being delivered and uh, there is just there's a, a big barrier and unless you fix that issue that they're having right now you're you're going to be very working a uh, cardiac arrest very shortly uh, so this this is the down and dirty version of shock you have the the perfusion triangle, which is composed of the heart, the blood, and the vessels, all those things go into ensuring that we have a delivery of oxygen and nutrients, um, and including the oxygen and the glucose, and a removal of those waste products. Anything that impedes that function from your heart, your, or your blood, or your vessels is going to result in shock. And if you ever have a low level of oxygen or you have a low level of glucose this can result in its own form of shock you can be hypoxic or you can also be in a diabetic uh, diabetic shock your, your glucose is low your oxygen is low and in those circumstances it's it's nothing wrong with the blood it's nothing wrong with the vessels it's nothing wrong with the heart but there is something wrong with the contents of that blood of um, of what's going on and so in those patients again um, just look at your patients treat them accordingly and these uh, this right here this triangle I hope that this is going to help and this is going to kind of give you a little bit more guidance and uh, a little bit more answers on where what types of shock are what and what's compensated shock what's decompensated shock and what's irreversible shock and um, and this is the down and dirty version of shock.